Find the more e-copy. Step through. Sail to the scrapyard. Step free. See the object go blue. Step four. Show the object to your family. Step five. Everyone in your family is dead. Step six. Everyone in your neighborhood is dead. Welcome back to Pagan Valley, everyone. After the last several months of growth on this channel, I have to give much of that credit to looking at YouTube horror series, and though we still have a couple series left to cover, I thought we'll take a break from the two hour long explained videos and talk about a real life horror story. But before we begin, let me remind you that Pagan Valley is growing incredibly quickly in the horror scene, and we recently set up a Patreon for our fans to help support the show and get their name in the show credits. Be sure to check the description for that link, right after you like, comment, and subscribe for more content. With that, let's begin our investigation into the Goiana Incident of 1987. Our story begins in Brazil, in a midland city called Goiânia, in the year 1985. There's a facility that has the country's cutting-edge technology in radiotherapy research, the Institute of Goiânia's Radiotherapy, or in academia known as IGR. The institute's leaders have just voted to make an enormous change for the entire plant. IGR was to change the location of their institute to a closer premise to the country's capital. All the scientists of IGR work tirelessly to move all their equipment and materials from the old building to the new one. Everything was moved, except for one device. The Institute's cesium-137 based teletherapy unit, a device that when set up would shoot in a combination of X and gamma rays in order to treat cancerous cells in the human body. A device that looked like this in 1985. The Institute had decided to leave behind this unit in the abandoned building instead of paying to have it transported to the new facility, which would have been dangerous and costly. Once IGR had moved, the abandoned facility was left untouched for years while the Goya's courts determined the fate of the old building. These courts would then be pressured to act more quickly when IGR reported the Kesium-137 core that was sat alone in the untouched building. Two years passed and on May 4, 1987, Sora Teniguti, then director of the Institute of Insurance for Civil Servants, used police force to prevent one of the owners of IGR, Carlos Figueiredo Bizarril, from removing the radioactive material that had been left behind. Figueroa of IGR went into a panic, warning the president of insurance of civil servants, Licio Texiero Borges, that he should take responsibility for what would happen with the Casium bomb. After the panic, the court of Goyas posted a security guard to protect the site. Meanwhile, the owners of IGR wrote several letters to the National Nuclear Energy Commission CNEN, warning them about the dangers of keeping a teletherapy unit at an abandoned site, but they could not remove the equipment by themselves once a court order prevented them from doing so. On September 13, 1987, the guard who was tasked with protecting the site did not show up for work. He took his family to a screening of the movie Herbie Goes Bananas. Taking advantage of the absence of the guard, Roberto Dos Santos Alves and Wagner Mota Peria illegally entered the partially demolished IGR site. 
they partially disassembled the teletherapy unit and placed the source assembly, which they thought might have some scrap value, in a wheelbarrow, taking it to Alves' home. Here, they began dismantling the equipment. That same evening, they both began to vomit due to radiation sickness. Nevertheless, they continued in their efforts. The following day, Piera began to experience diarrhea and dizziness, and his left hand began to swell. He soon developed a burn on this hand in the same size and shape as the aperture. He eventually underwent partial amputation of several fingers. On September 15th, Peria visited a local clinic where his symptoms were diagnosed as the result of something he had eaten. He was told to return home and rest. Alves, however, continued with his efforts to dismantle the equipment and eventually freed the casium capsule from its protective rotating head. His prolonged exposure to the radioactive material led to his right forearm becoming ulcerated, requiring amputation weeks later. Now you are probably wondering what kind of radiation was hitting the two thieves to cause such symptoms. Well, the answer is more simple than you think. The radiation attacking the two men was actually dampened by the capsule the casium sat in, which on September 16th, Alves succeeded in puncturing the capsule with a screwdriver, allowing him to see a deep blue light coming from the tiny opening he had created. He inserted the screwdriver and successfully scooped out some of the glowing substance. Thinking it was perhaps a type of gunpowder, he tried to ignite it, but the powder would not ignite. On September 18th, Alves sold the items to a nearby scrapyard. That night, Dever Alves Ferreira, the owner of the scrapyard, noticed the blue glow from the punctured capsule, thinking the capsule's contents were valuable or even supernatural. He immediately brought it into his house. Over the next three days, he invited friends and family to view the strange glowing substance. On September 21st, at the scrapyard, one of Faria's friends succeeded in freeing several rice-sized grains of the glowing material from the capsule using a screwdriver. Faria began to share some of them with various friends and family members. That same day, his wife, 37-year-old Gabriella Maria Faria, began to fall ill. On September 25, 1987, Devere sold the scrap metal to a third scrapyard. The day before the sale to this third scrapyard, on September 24th, Ivo, Devere's brother, successfully scraped some additional dust out of the source and took it into his house a short distance away. There he spread some of it on the concrete floor. His six-year-old daughter, Lady Das Neves Ferreira, later ate an egg while sitting on the floor. She was also fascinated by the blue glow of the powder, applying it to her body and showing it off to her mother. Dust from the powder fell on the egg she was consuming. She eventually absorbed one gigabequerel, or raw radiation, and received a total dose of six grays of ionized radiation. For comparison, so you understand how much radiation was hitting Lady's body, her taking in six grays of ionized radiation is more radiation than if she sat on the elephant's foot at the bottom of Chernobyl for an entire five minutes, which is about the same as her body being x-rayed more than 5.5 million times at the point of exposure. Gabriella had been the first to notice that many people around her had become severely ill at the same time, including her niece, Lede. On September 28, 1987, 15 days after the item was found, she reclaimed the materials from the rival scrapyard and transported them to a hospital. Because the remains of the source were kept in a plastic bag, the level of contamination at the hospital was low. In the morning of September 29th, a visiting medical physicist used a scintillation counter to confirm the presence of radioactivity and persuaded the authorities to take immediate action. The city, state, and national governments were all aware of the incident by the end of the day. And then panic ensued.
News of the radiation incident was broadcasted on local, national, and international media. Nearly 130,000 people in Guyana flooded local hospitals, concerned that they might have been exposed. Of those, 250 were indeed found to be contaminated, some with radioactive residue still on their skin. Eventually, 20 people showed signs of radiation sickness and required treatment. There were four fatalities due to the citywide exposure of Casium-137. The first was Emilson Alves de Souza, who was an employee of Dever Feria, who was working in the scrapyard when the capsule was being traded. He developed lung damage, internal bleeding, and heart damage and died October 18, 1987. The second was Lady Das Neves Feria, the daughter of Evo. When an international team arrived to treat her, she was discovered confined to an isolated room in the hospital because the staff were afraid to go near her. She gradually experienced swelling in the upper body, hair loss, kidney and lung damage, and internal bleeding. She died on October 23, 1987 of septicemia and generalized infection at the Marsilio Diaz Navy Hospital in Rio de Janeiro. She was buried in a common cemetery in Goiânia, in a special fiberglass coffin lined with lead to prevent the spread of radiation. Despite these measures, news of her impending burial caused a riot of more than 2,000 people in the cemetery on the day of her burial, all fearing that her corpse would poison the surrounding land. Rioters tried to prevent her burial by using stones and bricks to block the cemetery roadway. She was buried despite this interference. The third was Gabriela Maria Feria, the wife of the scrapyard owner De Vere, who became sick about three days after coming into contact with the substance. Her condition worsened and she developed hair loss and internal bleeding, especially of the limbs, eyes, and digestive tract. She suffered mental confusion, diarrhea, and acute renal insufficiency before also dying on October 23, 1987 the same day as her niece, of septicemia and generalized infection, about a month after exposure. The fourth was Israel Baptista dos Santos, and was another employee of Dever who worked on the radioactive source primarily to extract the lead. He developed serious respiratory and lymphatic complications, and was eventually admitted to the hospital, dying six days later on October 27, 1987. Just so you aren't asking what happened to Dever and the rest of the Feria family, Dever's life would become a living hell after losing his wife and niece due to his and his brother's greed. Dever would abuse alcohol until he developed cirrhosis of the liver, passing away in 1994. But Dever's story was now only one of thousands around the city. Although only 249 people tested positive for radiation out of 112,000, radiation lingers where the source is exposed for an unimaginable amount of time. Since the events of the incident, the people of Goiânia have created a prejudiced culture against families who come up positive for radiation even today, which has led to some social unrest since the initial exposure and is still common to get a small dose of radiation today despite the extensive cleanup that was attempted by an international coalition over the years. Now you're probably wondering what happened legally to IGR for this catastrophe. Well, it's honestly not that surprising. In light of the death's cause, the three doctors who had owned and operated IGR were charged with criminal negligence. Because the accidents occurred before the adoption of the Federal Constitution of 1988, and because the substance was acquired by the clinic and not by the individual owners, the court could not declare the owners of IGR liable. One of IGR's owners and the clinic's physicists were ordered to pay $100,000 in reals for the derelict condition of the building. Interestingly, the two thieves were not included as defendants in the public civil suit and no criminal charges were pressed against them. In 2000, the National Nuclear Energy Commission was ordered by the 8th Federal Court of Goyas to pay compensation of 1.3 million reals and nearly 750,000 US dollars 
to guarantee medical and psychological treatment for the direct and indirect victims of the accident and their descendants down to the third generation. To make this video a little less of a depressing nightmare, here are some interesting facts about the contamination. While the radioactive substance contaminated items you think would get attacked like cars, buses, farm animals, apparently a storage facility next to one of the scrapyards was holding over 50,000 rolls of toilet paper, all of which was contaminated, and led to areas of the city swearing off toilet paper out of fear of what was or wasn't contaminated. Also, the original teletherapy capsule was seized by the Brazilian military as soon as it was discovered in the house of the Alveses. And since then, the empty capsule has been on display at the School of Specialized Instruction in Rio de Janeiro as a memento to those who participated in the cleanup of the contaminated area. Lastly, in 1992, an episode of Captain Planet and the Planeteers depicts a somewhat loosely based version of this event in the episode A Deadly Glow, albeit with a happier And that's the Goiania incident of 1987. Hopefully this was as depressing to watch as it was to make, but I thought it was an interesting subject that I don't think a lot of people know about. And that's pretty much all I have to say on the incident. Now I must leave you and return to my catalogs. This has been Pagan Valley, and I wish you all a good evening.